What's good, everybody? So I am here to answer some of the common questions we get from Amazon FBA sellers or people trying to get into Amazon FBA. So welcome to the channel. My name is Eric Castellanos. I am the co-founder of Amazon Lit and we provide value to other Amazon sellers to help them scale their business. It's really a game changer as far as the opportunities and possibilities that come with selling on Amazon. It's truly endless. The amount of opportunity to scale business on Amazon is, is endless. There's so much opportunity, it's mind blowing, especially now with this whole COVID-19 thing that's going on, the opportunity is continuing to grow, continuing to be available to you. And if, if you're not gonna take it, somebody else is. So I'm here to discuss the benefits and how really you, I'm trying to get in the center of the screen here. Center. The benefits of selling on Amazon and really what you should be doing in order to take your business to the next level. You know, so I'm here to answer any questions you got. Um, right now, I got a list. I got a list right here in this notebook. I got a list of questions that I'm going to go over and share with you as far as Amazon FBA goes. So we will start with that and then we will take it from there. You know, so if you got any questions, Eric, you will be posting this video after the live is over. Absolutely, I'll be posting this video after the live is over. It will be on YouTube forever. This is that forever content. My man, Will, no problem, bro. I appreciate you. So some of the questions that we normally get um, from people are like, what software do we use, right? Like, what software do I need? Now, without a doubt, a must-have software is Keepa, 100%. All of our buying decisions are based on Keepa's graphs and Keepa's metrics. So if you do not have Keepa, you need to get Keepa. And if you're not willing to invest the $19.99 a month, then you are not ready to sell on Amazon. You are not in a position to start selling on Amazon because it's such a small investment. I'm talking like such a small investment. $19.99 is nothing is nothing to grow your business, absolutely nothing. So it's imperative to have Keepa. And then you also wanna have a software that checks how many, how much inventory one of your competitors have. So in our case, we use How Many. How Many does a great job at checking uh, competitors' inventory levels. And the reason why you wanna have these softwares is A, Keepa, you can track price fluctuations and rank fluctuations. And we break all this down in our eSellers RI program that we're dropping in a few weeks. Um, and you will be know, you will know about that, especially if you join the waitlist. And if you haven't joined the waitlist, check out our bio on Instagram and you can join the waitlist. But we, we, we want to track, you want to track that keep a chart. You want to track it and look at the rank and how the different price fluctuations affect the rank, how it goes up when the price goes up, how it goes down when the price goes down. And you want to analyze these listings and know these listings like the back of your hand. And then how many lets you know how many units your competitors have. So the importance of knowing that is it will give you a better indication of how many units you should purchase. And then some other softwares that you definitely want to have are um, some sort of FBA calculator. There's tons of them out there, tons of different FBA calculators um, to use, and you definitely want to have an FBA calculator. And then something else we recommend is DS Quick View. You definitely want to have DS Quick View. And what DS Quick View is, it gives you essentially a quick view of the listing before you even have to click on it. So when you're searching on Amazon and all the listings are visible, you smash. Uh, at the bottom, you can see on DS Quick View, it gives you the ASIN, it gives you the rank, it gives you all of that information. So if anybody has any questions, create. Just got a question here. How to grow up my Amazon seller account by arbitrage. I wouldn't let me type it in my own chat. 
Oh, that's because I'm logged into a different account. Give me one second here. I gotta log into the right account. That would make sense. So then I can, why is my account not even on here? Let me log in here. We'll do that. I'm just logging in so I can respond to your messages. Fantastic, phone's about to die. Logging in, all the good stuff is happening right now. Everything that I want to happen is happening. So that's how life goes sometimes. You just gotta deal with it. Oh, here we are. That photo. All right, so let me just grab my cell phone charger. Give me two seconds. Let me grab my cell phone charger. And then it's and then it's back to provide a new value because that's what we're here for. Let me just plug this in here. Plug this in here. All right, back in business. Cell phone is charged. Let's get to some questions. Deny. Um, so, but. Batuhan Kermi said, how to grow up my Amazon seller account by arbitrage? Should I enter the list as FBA if there is Amazon? Oh, should you enter the listing FBA if Amazon's selling on it? Now, it's once again, it's all about keep a charts. We sell a lot of inventory on listings that Amazon is on. Tons of inventory on listings that Amazon is on. What you're looking for is a listing that Amazon is not dominating the buy box. And how you know if it's they're dominating the buy box is by that Keepa chart. You can literally click on different days, different hours of the day, and see who is in the buy box at that time. Something else you're looking for is the Amazon price consistently much higher than the buy box price. And if that's the case, then that is a good listing to sell on. We probably do close to $2 million in sales a year on listings that Amazon sells on. So there's a huge opportunity to make money on listings that Amazon sells on. So you wanna analyze those Keepa charts. Keepa is key, I can't express that enough. The importance of Keepa, it's really a game changer. So I got some questions here that I've written down from people who've asked questions in the past. And if you have a question about Amazon FBA, now is the time to ask it. I'm going to be here for at least a half hour just answering these questions, going through what it takes to scale an Amazon business. Also, in a few weeks, we're dropping our eSellers RI program, which is essentially Amazon 101. It takes you from the beginning all the way to the end, exactly the steps and processes that we've taken to grow our business. We break it down in over 70 videos, interviews with our team, interviews with other professionals within the Amazon industry, and we hand it to you on a silver platter for you to take action. And as soon as you take action on the information provided, I can promise you your business will grow. It's the same methods that we've used to take our business from just a small little basement operation to now one of the largest FBA sellers in the world. We are a top 50 Amazon company, and we know you can double, triple, even 10 extra sales if you follow the information that's provided in this program. It's game changer. Oh, my brother's calling me. So some of the other common questions we get is how much money do I need to start? Now that's definitely a multi-sided question because it depends on what you want to start in. Now, if you want to, if you only have really, I guess the best way to start would be to talk about how much money you have to start with. And then we can get into what types of selling on Amazon you could do. Now, if you only have a couple hundred bucks, really anything less than a thousand dollars, $1,500, I recommend doing retail arbitrage, which is going to local stores in your area, Targets, Walmarts, Marshalls, Home Goods, and buying items at retail price to then sell on Amazon. And you can use your seller's app. You can. There's also other um, services out there that you can use to scan items and set prerequisites in them. But essentially, you scan that item you check for its profitability, and if you're making some money on it, it's the listing isn't too competitive, 
um, you have an opportunity to sell it, then absolutely you could purchase that product and start generating more revenue. So you could turn that $500 into $1,000 and then that $1,000 into $2,000, $2,000 of four, so on and so forth until you're able to scale enough revenue to get into one of the other ways of selling on Amazon. And now two of those other ways, well, really there's a third way too if you don't have a lot of money. And, and it's, it's similar to retail arbitrage, but I, I keep I keep it completely separate and I call it selling used books, right? There's a lot of sellers out there um, that just sell used books and they make a nice amount of money selling used books because the beautiful thing about selling used books is they're inexpensive, right? You can get a used book for a dollar, two dollars, might sell on Amazon for 20, 30 bucks. So they have a high return on investment for a little investment for a small investment you get a lot on your return so you can go spend 50 bucks on used books and turn that 50 bucks into 500 dollars but you got to be willing to put in the work um, and now the next type of selling on amazon would be private label now private label recommended to have a few thousand dollars at the bare minimum because a you have to purchase the products right so not only do you have to research the product that you want to purchase but you have to then purchase and place an order with your wholesaler or distributor i mean place an order with your manufacturer to get that order processed and shipped to you so they're going to have an moq Let's say the MOQ is 500 units and the product is $2 a unit. That's an MOQ of $1,000. So you have to have that initial investment to invest in the product. And then also, you're going to need to invest in advertising, right? And advertising for us on a brand new private label product looks anything like $15 to $50 a day, sometimes even more. So you need to set aside a budget based on your research that can support the advertising for your private label products. Now we do about 2 million, close to $2 million a year in private label. So we know what it takes to build some private label brands. We own four different trademarks um, for our private label companies. And under those four different trademarks are about 40 different SKUs that we consistently sell. And there's a lot of money to be made in private label, but you need to know what you're doing. I see it all the time. People invest in private label. They invest in a product from a from a uh, manufacturer. They get it, and then they have no idea what to do with it once it arrives. So with that being said, the last and final type of selling on Amazon that I'm going to go over is wholesale. Now, wholesale is selling volume replenishable goods purchased from wholesalers or distributors. This is the business model that we focus on for a few reasons. Reason number one it's scalable. It's 100% scalable. Right now, currently in our inventory, and you can have them currently in your inventory, and I'm sure if you're doing wholesale, you do have SKUs like this in your inventory. We have SKUs that sell 150, 200 units a day consistently. Now, yes, we may only be making two or three dollars every time we sell that product, but three dollars times 200 units a day that's six hundred dollars a day in gross profits let's do some math here 600 times 365 that's two hundred and nineteen thousand dollars in gross profits off that one product that you're selling 200 units a day of let's say you even got one product that you're only selling 20 units a day of and you're making three dollars so 20 times three that's sixty dollars a day but let's say you got 20 of those products. So 60 times 20 equals 1,200. Now times 365, that's $438,000 in gross profits off of 20 products making $60 a day. That's a game changer. Um, so those are the four types of selling on Amazon. There's, and then there's online arbitrage, which I don't even talk about. I discourage online arbitrage unless you're following Amazon's terms of service, um, which states that you cannot ship products to an Amazon customer if they are packaged in another, in another company's box. So you couldn't, essentially it's against their terms of service to purchase from Walmart and sell it on Amazon because when Walmart ships that product to the end consumer, it's going to be in a Walmart box. And we get phone calls and DMs and emails all the time about customers and clients who've been suspended from Amazon for doing exactly just that. So you do not want to violate their terms of service. Whatever form of Amazon you're selling, 
whether it's wholesale, retail arbitrage, online arbitrage, use books, private label, make sure you're navigating within Amazon's terms of service and you can guarantee your success. At least you can guarantee that you won't get suspended from selling on Amazon, which would eliminate any option for profitability. So we got some questions here. Uh, Batuhan Kermi said, could you please explain the buy box rules? As far as I know, Amazon does not explain the buy box rules clearly by percentage. So the buy box is an algorithm. Um, it has a bunch of different metri metrics in it. And there's really not a lot of information as far as what exactly those metrics are and how they um, how they switch up who receives the buy box. But there's a few things that I know. Um, so what some of the things that allow or determine who wins the buy box is shipping method. So is it prime or is it merchant fulfilled? So those are two instances that Amazon is going to choose who wins the buy box. Now, normally prime offers win the buy box over merchant fulfilled offers, but then it takes into consideration the price. What is the most competitive price for that listing? So Amazon's considering the shipping method, also the price. They're also considering the Cust or the third party sellers account health. So how long have they been selling on Amazon? What are their trusted customer reviews? You know, what is their feedback rating? All things like that. They are also considering how much inventory you have in stock. And something else that I think they're considering, but there's really not a lot of talk about it, is where your units are located in Amazon fulfillment centers. And let me paint this picture for you. So let's say I'm a seller, you're a seller, right? I have a majority of my inventory on the West Coast, right? Let's say California and Nevada is a majority of my inventory. Now you're a seller and your majority of your inventory is in the Midwest in Amazon's fulfillment centers. Let's just say Indiana and Idaho, right? If a customer is shopping in New York City and they're purchasing a product, I think that the buy box would be given to a third party seller who is closer to New York City because Amazon is paying shipping fees to ship that product. So it wouldn't make logical sense for them to give when that customer is looking at that listing for them to give the guy in California with units in Nevada or California the buy box versus the guy in Idaho or Indiana the buy box because the distance in shipping is much larger. Now, I, now that I think about it, it'd really be simple to figure that out. I could just call up some of my friends in California and say, hey, check this listing. Who has the buy box? Check this listing. Who has the buy box? And then we can figure that out. But so there's a bunch of different metrics for who wins the buy box. Um, and they do not rotate evenly. Buy box percentage changes. There's some listings for a week. We'll have 80% of the buy box. And then we'll be at the same price and competitive. And for two days, we'll get 10% of the buy box. And then 80% and then 40%. So Amazon decides who gets the buy box. Mankarit Singh said, I am about to sell spray hand sanitizer, hand sanitizer. What docs I need to have before making a new listing on Amazon? So hand sanitizer, honestly, my friend, I would stay away from it. I don't even know if you'd be able to create it. That, that could be a challenge, creating that listing, that hand sanitizer listing. Amazon is being super restrictive of the products that they're letting people sell on Amazon right now, especially with the whole COVID-19 thing. Now, pre-COVID-19, absolutely you could create a listing for hand sanitizer. Post-COVID-19, probably not. Probably not. Um, you may need to submit an MSDS, which is a material safety data sheet, and you also may need to submit some documentation um, stating the products that are in it. I'm unsure of exactly what documentation they would request, but from my experience selling at Amazon, it's going to be challenging creating that hand sanitizer listing. Um, I'm about, all right, so Batum Sermi said, how to enroll Vendor Central at Amazon. So Vendor Central used to, you used to be able to enroll, I believe it's an invite only program. Um, and they kicked a lot of sellers out of Vendor Central because they weren't cutting it as far as sales revenue. So now Vendor Central only takes on certain brands and certain customers based on how much sales they're doing. So if you have a very small brand, chances of getting on Vendor Central are slim to none. 
Um, listen, anybody who's just joining, thank you so much for joining me on this beautiful Sunday afternoon. It's bright and sunny over here in New Jersey. Hope you're having a lovely Sunday. I'm just here to provide value, doing what we do, answering questions, letting you know what's going on in the Amazon world and what we can do to help. You know, we've managed to help over 500 sellers scale their Amazon business and take their Amazon business to the next level, in turn, providing financial stability and freedom of time so they can spend more time with their family and friends and doing what they love the most. What is the difference between Amazon wholesale business account and a professional account? Um, so a business account, I think this is your question. And let me know if I'm answering this correctly. Uh, but a business account is just an account that's linked to a business uh, debit card or credit card. So if you have, if you own a business and you set up your Amazon account, um, then you will have uh, the option to choose it as a business account. And in turn, you can make offers on third party business, people who are rolled in B2B, business to business. And you can make offers discount on those items we do a lot of b b2b purchasing ourselves as a business on amazon we buy all our toilet paper paper towels on amazon and we'll make an offer um, let's say the product selling for 19.99 we'll make an offer to that customer for a product or to that third-party seller for 18.99 hey we'll buy 10 of these can we get them for two dollar discount um now a professional account it's 39.99 a month and what it allows you to do is ship products with the Prime badge to FBA facilities and then Amazon list them on Amazon. A Prime offer, uh, two-day shipping to the end consumer really optimizes your opportunity to grow and scale your business. Um, so you definitely want to have a Prime, I mean a professional seller's account versus an individual seller's account, which are some different fees associated. There's not a monthly fee. It's like a per listing fee. Um, up to a certain amount of listings per month. All right, so next question I got in my book here is when do you know when to get a warehouse? So the simple answer is when you're running out of space, right? Regardless of where you are. If you're in your mom's garage, you're running out of space, maybe it's time to consider a warehouse. If you're in your basement, you're running out of space, it's probably time to consider a warehouse. If you're in a warehouse, you're running out of space, it's probably time to consider a larger warehouse. These are times in which you need to think and analyze your money and make sure you have some money set aside so you can pay the additional monies for rent. Now, keep in mind, when you scale and grow to a larger location, it will allow you the opportunity to continue to scale and grow your business. Now, there's going to be a lot of fear involved with that transition, moving from an 800 square foot garage to a 1800 square foot or 5,000 square foot warehouse. There's going to be a lot of fear and apprehension in that decision, but I can promise you, if you set that fear aside and make that leap of faith and put in every action necessary for you to scale your business, you will not only grow into that space, but you will outgrow that space and you will need a larger warehouse. And with that being said, whenever you plan on getting a warehouse, if you think you need 2,000 feet, get 3,000 square feet. If you think you need 10,000 square feet, get 12,000 square feet. It will force you to grow into that warehouse. It will force you to purchase more inventory to fill that warehouse up. And it will allow you to make more money in turn generating more profits on amazon.com. It's really a game changer. Uh, will said, what's your per unit prep cost? Is it worth it over using a third party prep company that charges say 49 cents a unit to prep, for example. So our per unit prep cost is right around 32, 34 cents um, to produce one ASIN out of our facility. These are metrics we pay very close attention to and you need to pay close attention to. We call this the production cost per ASIN, so PCPA. That is a huge piece of information you need to know, your PCPA, your production cost per ASIN, what it takes for you, what it costs you 
to produce one product out of your warehouse. And now how you figure out your production cost per ASIN, I'll show you on this piece of paper. It's pretty straightforward. how to figure out your PCPA. You do this, monthly expenses divided by monthly orders. That will give you your production cost per ASIN. And included in this monthly expenses is software, rent, labor, um, service fees for, let's say you got a truck and it needs to get fixed or a forklift and it needs to get fixed. It's very simple figuring out your PCPA. It is monthly expenses divided by monthly orders. So let's say, let's say you have, let's do a quick example here so I can show you exactly what I'm talking about. So let's say your monthly expenses are $50,000 right? $50,000 monthly expenses. And you sell 120,000 units a month. So $50,000 in monthly expenses and your monthly order total is 120,000 orders, right? And this is to figure out your CP or your PCPA production cost, your production cost per ASIN. That's what you're figuring out here. So we're gonna do $50,000, which is right here, divided by 120. That means your production cost per ASIN is 0 0.41 cents. Now this is a very healthy production cost per ASIN. This is very healthy production cost. 41 cents is healthy, healthy, healthy. If you can get down to this production cost of 41 cents per ASIN, then you're beating any prep center that I know of. Um, even Amazon, they charge 30 cents, but it's going to take you three weeks to have your inventory available. Um, they might make a mistake. There's just so many issues um, with using Amazon as a fulfillment center or a prep center. So that's figuring out your your PCPA, which is your production cost per ASIN. Listen, I'm going to be here for a little bit. So if you got any questions, please provide them on the right in the question box and just let me know. I got some more questions right here. So if I don't get any more questions, I'm just gonna scroll right into these. Keyboard Warrior, how do you overcome lost items and boxes not received in shipments? Unable to recognize within shipment contents counted and confirmed, open up case and support just say confirmed. It's unreal. So what we like to do to reconcile um, missing items and shipments, and listen, I understand your pain keyword warrior because a lot of times we submit these cases for missing items and shipments and what they say is oh well you're missing 20 units of this well we receive 20 units more of that so what we're going to do is replace the lost 20 units with the extra 20 units now our production is pretty on point and i'm sure yours is as well so the chances of us sending an additional 20 units that we didn't know about slim to none right so what we do is we submit a stamped bill of lading from Amazon. Um, but that works for us because we have a carrier that we know personally who drops our shipments off to Amazon. So what you could do is submit invoicing for that lost item, for that lost product upon shipment receival and let them know, hey, this order or this product was on this order that was dropped off. It was never received. Here is the invoice for the 120 orders. You only received 80 of them. You know, and also you want to submit with that invoicing proof of a bill of lading. So you should be creating bill of ladings for your bowls or your shipments when they get sent to Amazon. So you could send it as proof that that item was actually sent to Amazon. I hope that answers your question keyboard warrior so i'm going to take a, a little minute here to let everybody know that in a few weeks we're dropping the e-sellers ri program this program 
is truly amazing. It has over 90 videos, over 60 hours of content. It's got 25 weeks of personalized mentoring, tons of discounts and bonuses, access to the private face group group where other six, seven, eight, nine sellers or six, seven, eight, and nine figure sellers will be in attendance answering questions. It's really a game changer. They, Keyword Warrior said, they fight it, just say it was never in box. Absolutely, they're going to say that. And they're probably going to sell it on Amazon themselves. You know, but listen, it's part of the game, man. It's part of the game. If you're submitting all the required documents and you're doing your best to get back those fees, um, then it's part of the game. Also, for other type of missing inventory, lost or damaged inventory within Amazon's warehouse, you can use a software for that. Um, you know, a refund manager is a software you could use for that. Um, there's a bunch of other ones you can use if you just Google uh, reimbursements for Amazon services then they will pop up and you can definitely pay so what they do how they operate is they take a percentage of the money that they get back from amazon so let's say they find ten thousand dollars in lost and damaged inventory they may charge you 20 percent for that item so you they would keep two thousand of that um ten thousand dollars and you would get back the other eight thousand based on that service it's really a game changer game changer um so i got some other questions here let's see all right so next question i got is when do you know to hire an employee that's a great question that is a great question when do you know to hire an employee phenomenal question and the answer to that is when you don't have enough time to do it by yourself anymore you know, when you find yourself running around for 12, 13 hours a day, and there's just not enough time in the day for you to produce and do everything that you need to do, that is the time to hire an employee. Even if it's going to cost you a little bit of money, I know when you hire your first employee. I just, uh, what, maybe a year ago, we hired our first employee for a new business. Um, I was a little nervous about it. You know, I was thinking about paying this girl, you know, four or $500 every week. I was like, wow, that, that money, it's really not coming in right now. But what hiring her did was allowed us to stop working in the business and start working on the business. So hiring an employee is crucial part in allowing your business to scale. It's imperative, right? Because you can't do everything yourself. I know me, I'm a control guy. I want to have the control of everything. But one of the best things that Sebastian and I do on a daily basis is relinquish that control and give it to our employees. Let them take care of it, right? And if you don't have an employee, put some applications out there or put some job postings out there and start interviewing people. The beautiful thing about interviewing and hiring employees is you don't have to keep them. There's no requirement that you have to keep them for a month. You let them know when you hire them, hey, I'm bringing you in for a trial two week run or trial three week run. If I think you're a good fit and you think you're a good fit for this position after two weeks, then we'll keep you. And if not, then we're going to part ways and let you go. And that's a perfectly logical explanation for hiring employees. People do it all the time. It's not like because you hire someone, they have to work there forever. You know, and really anything less than two weeks, it's too tough to tell if they're even going to be good at it, especially if it's something they've never done before and they're just learning how to do it. It's going to take some time to get a hang of that. But once they get the hang of it, they may be really good at packaging products or researching inventory from wholesale catalogs, finding products to sell on Amazon, organizing your warehouse, receiving and packaging and shipping purchase orders, like whatever it is, they may have that, that next level skill that you're looking for and they may be a great fit for your company. But if they're not a great fit for your company, that's fine. You just part ways. Let them know, hey, thank you so much for coming in for the position. Unfortunately, we're going to have to let you go. You're not a good fit for the company. And then if they're... You know, if they have any kind of inclination of growth, they would hopefully ask, which most of them don't, which I don't understand. They would hopefully ask, well, hey, what was it that I was missing? I know if I'm getting let go from a job, I want to know what I was missing so I can work on that for my next job. But not to my surprise, a lot of people don't care. They just walk out. Here's a here's a quick little funny story for you. Um, so 
we I hired this guy actually. We we're looking for warehouse employees in the middle of COVID nineteen. So I hired this guy from a, a he was a friend of a friend, and she vouched for him. And so I was like, all right, let's bring this guy on, right? So we brought him on, and he's working in the warehouse with the production stations for maybe two hours, right? He's downstairs working for two hours, and then. It was uh, it wasn't even lunchtime yet, but he was upstairs, which is weird because usually the employees only come upstairs when it's lunchtime or if they have a question. And he wasn't asking me a question. And I see him. We have this window that overlooks our warehouse, and he's standing. He's standing in the window like this with his arm crossed, and he's just like observing. And Sebastian sees him, and I see him, and I'm like, "What is this guy doing? You know, he's been here for two hours." So I just let him be. You know, I don't even say anything. I figure maybe he's just taking a quick little five minute break, which is cool with me. Um, and then a couple minutes later, he comes into my office. He's like, yeah, Eric, uh, like, you know, I was really hoping to get like a managerial position, like something where I could, you know, I think I'm smarter than just packaging products. Like, what do I need to do to become a manager here? And I was like, uh, I forgot his name, but I was like, Dave, like you're doing it. That's what you need to do to become a manager here. You need to package products. You need to understand every aspect of this business before you can even consider a managerial position in this business. You need to package products from the rip. You need to receive invoices and POs from the loading dock. You need to load shipments up. You need to do, you need to do a little bit of product research. You need to deal with some customer questions. You need to understand every aspect of this business before you can start managing people who operate in this business. Um, and I explained that to him and, and he was just like, okay. And he, and he, uh, he seemed very disappointed and, uh, and he went back downstairs and he came up like five minutes later and he's like, Eric, this just, this, this isn't the position for me. And I was like, all right, that's fine. Like, I'll, you know, we'll write you a check for your hours. Um, when we process payroll at the end of the week and, um, it was nice doing business with you. And, uh, and he lingered for a little while. He lingered and kept asking some questions and and i think he was just a little lost and confused he was young and it doesn't surprise me because a lot of people who are young from my understanding they want everything handed to them on a silver platter they don't want to put in that work for it and you got to put in that work i put in that work sebastian put in that work other successful people put in that work a lot of people want things handed to them i know we're not going to hand you the solutions and the answers to all your problems we could show you what needs to be done but we're not going to hand it to you so that was I actually hold the record, Sebastian, Ted, and I were just talking about it. I hold the record for hiring the employee that stayed with us the shortest amount of time. And it was that gentleman. I'm going to call him Dave. But he was there for maybe, I don't know, two and a half hours. Two and a half hours. So, yeah, so when to hire employees. You hire employees when you can't do everything yourself, right? When you're spending 12, 13 hours a day. Um, doing product research and you don't have time to package your inventory. Now, another question that follows when to hire an employee is who is the first employee to hire? And that question, the answer to it is a packer. So someone who's packaging your products and shipping them to Amazon, someone who's doing the poly bagging, you know, someone who's doing the boxing, putting the box labels on the boxes, putting the FN SKUs on the poly bags or on the UPCs directly on the product, throwing the expiration date, checking to make sure it's the correct product. The first employee you need to hire is someone who's doing the packing. So you are not doing the day-to-day -day monotonous tasks of pa packaging products, and you could be out there sourcing new inventory, whether it's through wholesale or retail arbitrage, whatever way or method you're doing it, finding new private label listings, and you can source that inventory and pay someone else a lot less than it would cost you to spend your time to sort to package those products. So the first employee you want to hire is someone to package your products. Game changer. 100% game changer. All right. I got one question left here. If nobody's got any questions in the comments, then in a couple minutes here, we're going to wrap this up. I appreciate everybody's time. I am super grateful to have all of you joining me in this live session. This is going to be available on our YouTube channel forever. So if you missed the live, if you want to go back and listen to a question, you can just go back and check it out. But this will be here forever. It's for you to access and you to watch. Um, so the last question I have here is how to build relationships and find wholesalers and distributors. 
Now, I'm going to give you one method in this video. The video is great quality. Thanks, Jorge. It's from my cell phone, too. I'm impressed. So, um, the last question was how to find, locate, and build relationships with wholesalers and distributors. Now, in our eSellers ERI program, we have over six different methods that we use continuously that have allowed us to grow relationships with some of the largest wholesalers and distributors in the world. And you can do the same thing if you implement these tactics that we teach you in the program. But right now, I'm going to give one of them you, to you just on the strength of appreciation. And that one is Google keyword searches. So you would start in a Google tab, right? wide open Google tab, completely empty, empty search bar, and you would type in a few keywords, starting in your immediate area. Now, the reason why you want to start in your immediate area um, is because you may have an opportunity to build that relationship in person, which is huge, right? You could always branch out to your nationwide search, but if you could immediately find a wholesaler distributor in your backyard, 20 minutes away, 30 minutes away, you'll be able to build that in-person relationship, and that's really where you get the deals. That's really where you capitalize on those discounts. So I, I would start with the Google search using basic keyword terms. So let's say you live in Tennessee, right? You would do Grocery Wholesalers Tennessee, Toy Wholesalers, Tennessee. Beauty Distributors, Tennessee. Um, electronic Wholesalers, Tennessee. Right, so now you're just, you're just gathering information from the state. You're not calling any of these companies either yet. You're just documenting that information. Just documenting that information. Getting their phone number, getting their email. You're not calling them yet. You want to do things in clips, right? So when you're focused on, on finding wholesalers and distributors, you're just focused on that. You're not focused on calling them and finding them at the same time. And then you want to expand your search, right? And you could either do a regional search. Um, so you could do grocery wholesalers and distributors Midwest, right? Personal care wholesalers midwest toy distributors midwest and then you want to branch out even further and do a nationwide search so there there would be no third keyword it would just be like grocery distributors or personal care wholesalers or toy wholesalers or health and beauty distributors and you're just going to start clicking around on these different opportunities and looking for essentially name brand products and stuff like that when you're looking at their website and some of the biggest Wholesalers and distributors we work with don't even have websites. So there's other methods you need to use to acquire new accounts, new wholesalers and distributors. And we go over all of that in detail in our eSellers RI. We got some questions that just came in. So GT said, are you going to be at ASD coming up? Absolutely, we'll be at ASD. We just booked our trip, uh, I want to say, a week ago. We're flying out on Saturday the 1st. And we're leaving on, I think, Tuesday the 4th. So we'll be out there attending the show on Sunday and Monday. Sunday, August 2nd. And Sunday um, or Monday, August 3rd. We'll also be offering a trade show walkthrough while we're there. So you can join us, walk the show trade show floor where we introduce you to reputable brands and distributors that we personally know and have done business with. And kind of guide you through the process because it's a huge show. It was a huge show. Um, or it is a huge show, ASD, and there's a you can literally spend a whole day on there, a whole day walking the showroom floor, just completely lost, having absolutely no idea what to do, where to go. And I know for us and for you as well, your time is valuable. So we want to make sure you're optimizing your time where you attend the show. So we'll be offering the trade show walkthrough. But listen, GT, if you're going to be at ASD, send me a DM on Instagram when you're out there. Or we'll uh, link up. We're also going to host a free meetup as well. Uh, Steve O'Brien said, are you going to be at, or no, Steve O'Brien said, is a warehouse required for your business model? And if not, why do you have one? Extra profit for you? Um, so a warehouse, listen, it's not required for our business model. You could use prep centers. You could ship directly to Amazon. I prefer not to do it like that. Sebastian and myself, you know, we made a decision many years ago not to do that. We wanted to build something in the house. So is it required? No. Do I think it's necessary and optimal? Yes. And what also you could do with that warehouse is that warehouse 
has uh, opened up new opportunities to generate revenue, right? So we do pallet storage for other companies. Sometimes we store other people's pallets for, you know, $80, $100 a slot for the month. You know, you store 20 pallets, that's $2,000 a, a month in additional profits, you know, or paying your, your warehouse rent. We also ship Merchant Fulfilled through Walmart, through Jet, and through eBay. So having um, that space, now it's only about ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 a month we're doing through those marketplaces, but allows us to optimize that. Also, we ship FBM through Amazon. So having a warehouse allows us to sell an additional $100,000 a month in FBM fulfilled by merchant purchases or MF merchant fulfilled purchases through Amazon. Um, it also allows us having a warehouse to capitalize on taking on bigger brands because you can look and be and invite that brand to your warehouse that's one of our selling points hey we have a state-of-the-art warehouse come check it out we invite you to come through order some baked goods or some pies or some snacks have them come through sit them down in your conference room give them a tour of the warehouse let them know hey this is how we package products this is how we produce products Give them an in-depth look inside of your business. It's a great selling point to capitalize on closing bigger brands. Um, what software is to scan wholesale lists? Keyword warrior. Um, so the software we recommend is Scan Unlimited. If you go to our Instagram link uh, or Instagram bio link you can smash that and it says discounted services there's like 77 percent off amz scout which we use to research our private label brands and also check the quality of wholesale listings but then there's scan unlimited there's a 50 percent discount in that link in our bio on instagram um, so you could check that out and i'm going to actually put that link down at the bottom in the description once this video uploads and populates um Artraf Ratched said, all your distributors in the U.S. Yes. Um, let me see here. I believe so. We have one manufacturer overseas um, out in China. Yeah, all our distributors in the U.S. We've done some business. I did business with, I think it was a Brazilian company. They had like a kid's uh, food snack. I met them at a trade show. Uh, we took on their products. They didn't want to invest as much in advertising. So I had trouble really launching it and taking it off the ground. Ended up with a lot of expired goods because they gave us short coded inventory. So we ran into some issues there. Um, but I would say all of our distributors in the US, yes. You guys should do a podcast. Thanks. I appreciate that. You know, I've considered it. Sebastian and I have definitely considered it. Uh, it's just crazy. And, and really, it's excuses, right? Because something um, something I don't have a lot of is time, right? Between Amazon Lit, consulting other sellers to increase their sales and revenue on Amazon, um, and operating one of the largest FBA businesses in the world, my time is, is very slim right but really to do a podcast all i have to do is take my video editor my videographer and be like hey Haley, every wednesday i want you to set this room up ready for sebastian and i to walk into a podcast all we'd have to do is walk in that room 45 minutes 30 minutes and start recording the podcast it'd really be that simple just haven't gotten around to it yet but definitely an option how do you keep track of inventory and what products are still profitable? So there are definitely some repricers out there um, that let you know how many units of each product you're selling. Um, one of the repricers we're going to offer a discount to is in our eSellers RI. You actually, when you join it, you get two months completely free. You don't have to pay for it. It's, it's almost a $200 savings. Uh, that's just one of the many bonuses. But a lot of these softwares and repricers will have sales history. So you could literally click on the listing. It will populate in an additional box. And you could see how many units you've sold in the past 30 days. And then how many units you have left in stock. So based on how many you've sold versus how many units you have left in stock, you'll know how to make an educated buying decision. So let's say you had, um, we'll keep it easy. We'll do 30. Let's say in the past 30 days, 
you sold 30 units and in stock you have 15 units left so to keep track of inventory let's say in your repricer um, it says that your past 30 day sales is 30 units right and you only have 15 units left in stock so if everything on the listing is the same what what this these numbers are telling me I can just look at these numbers to know that I have about 15 that I have about 15 days worth of inventory left of this listing because at this rate I've sold 30 in the last 30 days so I'm selling about one a day and I only have 15 left so that's telling me I need to place an order with my wholesaler distributor based on lead times. Now, if it's going to take my wholesaler distributor 10 days to purchase and get this inventory shipped to me, then I should have purchased this inventory. You should have purchased this inventory a week ago. Because now, if it takes them 10 days, now you're at only five days left to get that inventory processed and shipped to Amazon. That is not a lot of time. It is not a lot of time to get your inventory processed, shipped to Amazon, and not only shipped to Amazon, but received and offered as a prime offer on Amazon without back order. So you have to understand your lead times. You can also use Excel files to track that information, but we recommend uh, paying for a repricer. And if you don't know what a repricer is, we don't have a repricer, we go into detail on that in our e-sellers RI as well. Um, what... How do you, what's your better software for product research for private label? Oh, we use AMZ Scout. I enjoy it. I like the usability of it, the user interface. Um, also, we pay practically nothing for it. We get a very high discount and we offer that same discount to you. Um, that discount is provided in the link in our bio on Instagram. It's like 77% off. My battery's dying here. My battery dying. There we go. Uh, it's like 77% off, so it's it's essentially nothing. Um, and we also use Keepa, and we just regular, we use, we use common sense, right? Like, we use uh, customer buying patterns. We just do some searches on, on Amazon, and we look for different markets to jump into and different niches to jump into. Um, how do you split the responsibilities between you and Sebastian? What is your main role at this point? Wow. I got a lot of roles. Um, so Sebastian definitely deals with the account health side of things. He deals with submitting the POAs. He deals with managing any um, complaints from Amazon for IP complaints or inauthentic products or... Uh, we don't really get any used, sold as new. We don't get any of those. But he's real on the account health side of things. And then we both, something we both do is jump in and assist on ordering, right? A, because it's our favorite thing to do. I love placing orders. It's I love just getting into the groove of things and placing some whopper orders. Sebastian and I sometimes will be at the office till like 2, 3 in the morning, like screaming at each other through the wall. Like, just place the $60,000 order. And he's like, yeah, just place the seventy, And like, we'll just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So that's something we both love to do. Something I do on the day-to-day -day is I manage basically all of our excess inventory and SKUs that aren't moving. So I make educated decisions whether to leave it at the price that it's at or drop the price, get rid of the inventory, bring the revenue back into the company to purchase more products. Um, and then we both, you know, we both look at ways to optimize the business. We both run multiple meetings through the week. I run a buyer's meeting on Tuesdays. We both are part of a motivation meeting on Monday mornings. Sebastian runs a web developer meeting on Thursdays. We have production meetings on Thursdays. Um, there's just tons of meetings, meetings all day long. Um, we also both build relationships with other companies. Right now I'm in the process of building a relationship with a multi-billion dollar business to represent their products on Amazon. It's been about, uh, I want to say we met them almost two years ago. And the, the discussion of growing this relationship has been in the process now for about six months. So it's taking some time. And whenever you're building a relationship with a multi-billion, even multi-million dollar business, the contract isn't going to get signed overnight. There's lawyers involved and different parties involved. It's a very strenuous and time-consuming process, and it doesn't always go through. So those are just some of the things I do every day. And then I also mentor tons of people um, out here.
and we work one on one and we've been building a course for the past two years and we also operate a wholesale business. So there's tons of stuff we do. And my battery, I don't know why my charger's not working, but my battery's getting low. So just keep that in mind. I got about maybe five minutes left here. Um, how do you split responsibilities? Did that keyword warrior? Uh, are you into wholesale or private label? What do you think about wholesale FBA automation services? I think they're a joke. I think they're a joke and a complete scam. Um, I don't know. I don't person. I know a lot of people in this industry, like a lot of people, thousands of people in this industry. I've never met one who's enrolled in an FBA wholesale automation process system and has been successful. I've met a few that invested $30,000 to be in an automation services and got completely duped and completely scammed, scammed out of their $30,000, just like GT said. You know, they have a dirty circle. Dirty circle, absolutely. And some of those guys, I don't care about calling them out. You know, some of those guys, if I can remember their names, T-Rod, he's one of them. I think his automation thing is a joke. Um, I don't know him personally, so I can't speak on his character, but says a lot when you're selling, you know, charging people $30,000 and, 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 and yeah, you guys know, him. you know, I don't got to go run down the list. You know, him. I think Kevin David's offering one now as well. Joke. Um, that's just my personal opinion. All right. Got about two minutes left here before. Oh, Laura, the program's dropping in a few weeks. Kenzo and Bunt, um, uh, program's dropping in a few weeks. And we're super excited about it. Two years of work, tons of bonuses and offers, hundreds, just ridiculous amount of hours of videos. Um, but a few weeks, it will be live. And you'll know, especially if you follow us on, subscribe to us on YouTube or Instagram or Facebook, you'll, you'll hear about it. Um, all right, last question I'm going to answer here. Or I, I got two more I'll answer. Two more questions. So first one is, are you doing more numbers than Reezy? Uh, first of all, shout out to Reezy. He's talking about Reezy. Reezy sells anybody who doesn't know. I got a lot of love for Reezy. Um, spent some time with him in Brooklyn over the summer. I respect his hustle, respect his grind. Um, yes, we are larger Amazon sellers than Reezy, but Reezy's got other hustles that he gets into. Right now he's doing, what is it, Instacart. Um, I also know he sells some merch. Uh, so he's just got a different hustle than us. But shout out to Reezy. Mad respect and love for Reezy. Um, any meetups in the New York, New Jersey area coming up? Yeah, absolutely. As soon as this whole COVID thing clears up, we're going to be diving into a meetup right here in our home state, New Jersey. Yeah, he's in a different game. He sells, he sells all books, just different ball game. And he does some retail arbitrage though. I respect the hell out of his hustle. Guy is always grinding. I love his footage, his content. He's just a good guy all around. All right. Well, I'm going to wrap this up. I appreciate your time. We're coming up on the hour. Much love to all of you. Keep in mind, in a few weeks, our e-sellers RI is going to release to the public. It's going to have limited availability. So if you're interested in signing up, smash that link in our bio on Instagram and join the wait list because it will only be available for a short amount of time. And as soon as those spots are filled up, we will accept no more entries. We are super excited to provide you and continue to provide you with more value. And as always, we'll be posting tons of free shit on our Instagram channel and tons of free content on our Facebook and YouTube channel. I respect all of you. Love the grind. Love the hustle. Stay motivated. Stay grateful and stay lit. Peace.